Streaming live across the country, tackling the topics everyone is talking about online. Share, engage, and interact. This is Newsfeed Now. What's up everyone? It's Wednesday and I've got some good news for you. You are halfway through the work week, so congratulations to you, congratulations to me. It is September 9th, I'm Hillary Hunt. This is News Feed Now. We're going to take a look at all the stories generating a buzz on social media. And we're going to start off with my favorite one. A Georgia sheriff's deputy out serving papers found quite the surprise inside of her car. And no, it wasn't Tom Brady, but it was a goat just like him. Body camera video you see right there from the sheriff's office shows the deputy went to get in her car and look, there's a goat. Sitting in the front seat, riding shotgun, looking to, you know, go maybe get cuffed or something. The deputy tried to get the goat out several times. At one point, the deputy was actually knocked onto the ground. Never get behind a goat like that. Come on. But she tells us she wasn't injured. And, you know, you're probably wondering why is her car door open? How would the goat get in there? She said she's actually had to run from vicious dogs multiple times, and that's why she actually leaves that door open. Ooh. That goat, he probably packs a mean kick. And moving on to some serious news over in the West. Wildfires raged unchecked through California Wednesday and gusty winds could drive those flames even more. In the past two days, helicopters were used to rescue hundreds of people stranded. The U.S. Forestry Service on Monday decided to close all eight national forests in the southern half of the state. And of course, shutter those campgrounds statewide. More than 1,400 firefighters are out there battling these fires, trying to keep people safe. Two of the three large blazes in state history are burning in San Francisco's Bay Area, though they are largely contained after burning for three weeks. And these fires seem to be everywhere in Oregon. Thousands of people have fled their homes as those wildfires fanned by those strong winds consume huge areas in the state and what the governor has coined a once in a generation event. Here's Wayne Haverly, who is in south of Portland. Rural firefighters scramble from fire to fire along this road near Mill City. But there are far too many to handle, and these fires move fast. All right, you can see uh, the fires in that uh, fir tree back there starting to crown. Uh, and sadly, you can see several buildings here have gone up. There's some intense heat coming out of the, uh, looks like a dumpster there, uh, and some storage containers catching this tree on fire. We're going to have to move back. We have heard some explosions from some propane tanks uh, here at this house, but it looks like a couple of buildings uh, have been taken out here. There's still one home remaining, but you can see there's fire burning right behind the house. If you can see that, Bill, right behind the house, that uh, it's coming up on the house here. So we're going to have to back off here just to stay safe. You can hear propane tanks kind of burning in the distance, blowing up throughout this area as there are spot fires and firefighters are stretched extremely thin right now. Those trying to escape like Lee Stone from Gates just watched important landmarks in his hometown burn to the ground. There's an old uh, school they use for some kind of training now. It's not an active school, but it's an old school. It's gone. It's burnt to the ground. Most of the homes burning near Mill City are on the north side of the North Sandyam River, but there are spot fires throughout the entire area. I talked to a camp host from Detroit Lake who evacuated last night and made a frightening journey to Salem. I've never have been in a fire, yeah. and I don't want to be. I don't want to be in it again. It is so hot. We, I mean, we were on the road and in the middle of the road, and you could feel the heat. It's already been a long, exhausting battle for these firefighters, a battle that still has no end in sight. Devastating for so many, but we do want to bring in our lease house now. She's just two hours from that fire that you just saw Wayne at, and what are you seeing out where you are right now, Elise? Hillary, so the thing is, you know, we're now about probably an hour and 45 from where you saw Wayne, and this is just another two fires that have erupted, and once again, the skies are filled with smoke. And 
the thing is these fires are burning separately but pushing two separate communities out of their homes. Where I am right now it is near Bald Peak. So we'll go ahead and have you take a look at some of that video that we shot early this morning. And it shows all of the emergency crews and firefighters trying to work to protect the structures because this is threatening more homes. So right now luckily they have been able to do a good job in their line of defense. No homes have been lost so far in this latest wildfire that sparked overnight. However, three barns have burned. More than 150 people have evacuated out of this neighborhood here in Washington County and they are not allowed to come home for the foreseeable future. There have been some evacuation centers set up for them at high schools about 40 minutes away. Hopefully those people are getting their families there but at the same time people have livestock and other animals that they are continuing to worry about and trying to get out of this area. So on top of the fire burning out this way, there is another, a second fire called the Power Line Fire. Power Line Fire, and that is burning just about 20, 30 minutes away from where I am right now. And again, that actually sparked yesterday morning, and that was because of all of the windy conditions that brought down a power line and then sparked that blaze. That one is currently burning at about 50 acres, and we're expecting to get another update on how far it spread later this morning. And again, that pushed out the entire community surrounding in Cherry Grove. So at this point, Hillary, it's really difficult. Um, because the resources are so strained. We have fires burning all across the state and more continue sparking up and they're very spread out. So deputies have been going door to door to notify all of the level three evacuees. Those are the ones who have to go now and are not allowed to be here. But if you look out here live, you'll see once again, the skies are orange, filled with smoke. Air quality is so poor and it looks really dark right now, but I can tell you the sun is up and it has been up for the past hour. So people are continuing to leave the area and of course people are very concerned. I've talked to residents who just want to know if their homes are okay. I can say that the homes right now are safe, but three barns again have been lost. Back to you. Thank you, Elise. Stay safe out there. And of course, our thoughts are with all those affected by these blazing fires right now. And on Capitol Hill, members of the Norwegian Parliament have nominated President Donald Trump for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. The man said the Trump administration has really played a key role in the establishment of relationships between Israel and the United Arab Emirates in his letter to the nomination committee. He has previously nominated President Trump for his meetings with North Korea. And let's talk about voting. Poll workers are warning of shortages this election day. Washington correspondent Kelly Meyer reports on the efforts by state officials and lawmakers in Washington to make sure these polling places can open and that everyone can cast their ballot. We had barely enough staff to actually cover this. After struggling through the primary election, Ryan Cragen is worried his Florida polling location won't have enough staff to cope with the larger crowds on election day. We need to break, right? I mean, it's a 14 hour day. I got to eat. <laughs> Staffing polling places is always a challenge, but the ongoing pandemic means many of the elderly volunteers say they plan to stay at home. In Alabama, we're not concerned about having the poll workers. Alabama is turning to young students for help. Secretary of State John Merrill says the state is allowing up to two high school students to work as unpaid student interns at each polling place. So we could have a maximum of approximately 4,000. Here in Washington, lawmakers on Capitol Hill want to reinforce poll workers by loosening restrictions. This just gives local governments and states more flexibility. Oregon Democratic Senator Ron Wyden introduced a bill that would remove requirements that poll workers be registered to vote in the same county where they are volunteering. They would still need to be registered in the same state. I certainly am prepared to pull out all the stops to make this happen. Cragen hopes more workers are added before November to avoid shortages that could close polling locations. There could very well be problems. I could, I could see that, given what I experienced this last time. Reporting in Washington, I'm Kelly Meyer. 
Let's stay in Washington. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said Tuesday the Senate would vote on a trimmed down Republican coronavirus package, though it has a very slim chance of passage in the face of Democrats for more of that sweeping aid. We've been talking about this. It's like a ping pong game. Republican stimulus plan include the unemployment money, but no second stimulus checks for Americans. McConnell called the bill a targeted proposal focused on what some of the very most urgent health care, education, and economic issues are. A procedural vote for that measure could come as early as Thursday. And of course, we have to bring in who I'm calling the expert on this bill, Jesse Tenur. And Jesse, I feel like we keep talking about this, keeps going back and forth. The ping pong game, when is it going to end? Good question. It's probably not going to end with that vote, though, that's supposed to be happening tomorrow. This is really McConnell's kind of push to essentially hold Democrats to their word to see how serious they are about quickly passing a coronavirus relief bill. Um, earlier on, Democrats had already voted on their own, and it was, you know, more than $2 trillion worth of relief. This would be about $700 billion, and a lot of the funds, about half, are repurposed already from what Congress has passed. So, like you said, those $1,200 stimulus checks, even though both sides and the White House have been supportive of that, are not included. What is included is um, a $300 federal supplement for the unemployment benefits. That's something that President Trump's executive order has already said. States have been pretty slow to implement that, but that would stay until the end of the year. There are liability protections in there for schools, businesses, hospitals against coronavirus related lawsuits. That's a big push from the GOP that they were able to get in there. And then um, some other measures as well. One is even to ex further extend um, a second round of those PPP loans that went out to help small businesses. And so even though it's called a skinny bill, Democrats are calling it emaciated. And it'll be interesting to see how those votes end up playing out tomorrow if some moderate Republicans as well are on the Democratic side. And then especially with that PPP for small businesses, you know, we've been reading articles about so many small businesses falling out because they're losing this funding. Just talk about why there's such a push to get that funding, especially for small businesses right now as the pandemic continues. Yeah, so what's interesting, too, is that um, Congress already approved, you know, billions and billions of dollars for it, but there's still $130 billion left over um, that haven't gone out yet. And so, um, you know, while there's been a push from Treasury Secretary Mnuchin to um, repurpose those funds and allow them to go elsewhere, that seems what um, to be what the GOP has kind of got on board with. But Democrats have been reluctant to do that because they keep arguing that especially minority-owned small businesses didn't even receive that first round of funding. And so, yeah, when we still are seeing small businesses close, um, both sides are arguing that we need to step in, that they need to step in um, to help them. But exactly how to do that is another thing that remains up in the air. And Jesse, lastly, you know, we say very slim chances of this passing. What happens from here if it doesn't again? What happens if it doesn't happen again? It's just negotiations continue, really. Um, it sounds like that the White House would be okay, Mnuchin said, with about a $1.5 trillion plan. And so that does get a little bit closer to what Democrats were asking for compared to this plan. Um, so really, we'll kind of see how this impacts negotiations. And then with the budget coming up, too, um, there's going to be a lot of big votes happening. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jesse Tenur from Washington. DC for us. Thank you, Jesse. Well, let's continue to talk about the coronavirus. It seems to be affecting everything because guess what? This isn't a trick. No trick or treating on Halloween. That's according to health officials in Los Angeles, California. The county's Department of Public Health has banned trick or treating activities along with Halloween parties, carnivals, and even the haunted houses. I know I wouldn't miss a haunted houses, but it's the latest update to the county's coronavirus health orders. Health officials say the activities really pose too much of a risk for spreading COVID-19. But not all Halloween fun is banned. You can still carve a pumpkin, have a costume contest, some of those car parades, drive through attractions still allowed. Health officials suggest anyone participating in this Halloween wear a face covering and practice social distancing. You know, face masks were in a long time ago for Halloween costumes. So it all kind of works. The kid will keep it on this year. And a weekly Zoom call among a longtime group of friends turned out to actually save a woman's life. The 69 year old was on a video call with four of her girlfriends when they noticed she started slurring her words, slumping over, just not seeming like herself. That's when her friends jumped into action. Here's Kimberly Chen. A weekly Zoom call among this longtime group of friends, July 30th. 
turned out to be a lifesaver for 69-year-old Dorothy Ferris from Palos Verdes. We normally end our calls at 6 o'clock on the dot. For some unknown reason, I like to think that it was intervention, divine intervention, that we extended this call to 616 that night, and that's when her symptoms first appeared. This particular night, we were talking about how did you meet your husband? And we were just laughing, laughing, laughing. And Dorothy was the last one. So we just said, Dorothy, okay, your turn. How did you meet Bill? And there was just silence. She started slurring her words and started slumping over. I just knew that something was going on. But I couldn't have said to you that my mind did not correlate it in a stroke. Intuitively, everybody just knew what role to take, to call 911, to call her husband, to stay on the Zoom weather. I called all of my prayer chains, my prayer warriors, and that's what we did. We prayed. Paramedics arrived to a locked front gate, but knowing that every minute counts, wasted no time getting in. And he repelled the fence. Um, to get into the, our home. Dorothy was rushed to Torrance Memorial Medical Center and underwent an operation to remove a clot. Every minute that somebody is without blood flow to certain areas of the brain, you lose function. Every half hour or so, we reduce the chances of her being able to walk out of the hospital like she did. I was able to walk, um, move my limbs. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. It took four splendid, splendid friends that saved my life and I don't know how you thank people who do that. Talk about a life-saving call there and a great group of friends. If you do see signs of a stroke including slurred speech, muscle weakness and mental confusion, you are urged to call 911 immediately. We are glad she is healthy and happy today. That's all the time we have for today. I'm sad to see you guys go, but we're going to be right back here tomorrow. Same place, same time. I hope you guys have a great day and join us right back here tomorrow. Make it a good one. Bye.